Um, very, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I'm trying to, let me try it again. Good afternoon to all of you. You see, I'm expecting the response from you and not those who are online. <laughs> so uh, please do just say, always, um, the Lord is good and all the time is good. Thank you so much for that piece of music you have sung together. You know, one of the beautiful things that this church has is actually the music we sing. Um, to be honest with you, and I said it somehow in the morning, one of the things that impressed me most the day I walked in this church for the first time, I, we didn't, I didn't know anything about this church, it was actually the music I had been sung. The kind of music that is sung in this church does not make you cry tears like that church I went to, you remember? But it makes you think. Um, so you have this beautiful um, criminology, and I think that is why even your theology is beautiful. I am, I am so glad that I belong to this church. So happy that I belong to this church. Um, so um, this afternoon, we are going to uh, reflect some, on something beautiful. Uh, to be honest with you, this is some of the messages that I've always wanted to, to share. And, uh, so um, I have given the message of this uh, afternoon a title that says, um, you are the light of the world. So this is in agreement or in, uh, in consistence uh, with the, uh, the theme that we, we had for this weekend. Now, beloved, um, in the morning, I said something that I, I believe you captured. I said to you in the morning that we are going to get to heaven, not because of the good things that we have done as Christians, but because of the relationship we had with Jesus. In other words, before you become the son of God, you will have to become a brother or a sister of Jesus. It's actually Jesus who introduces you to your father. And once the introduction is the one who introduces you to God, and once the introduction is done, that is when God becomes your father. And uh, um, it's high time that we as Christians, we really focus on our relationship with God. How has it been since we knew Jesus? You know, sometimes we, we are caught up with what people think about it, us. And that is why Christians keep on being in the church with secret sins. So as long as somebody does not know about what you are doing, you're okay. And the moment the thing you've been doing for years comes out, you say, ah, oh, I'm sorry. And let me tell you some of these repentances, or oh, sorry, this kind of sorry, sorries, are not received because they are just regrets of being caught. Remember, both, both Peter, both Peter and, 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 uh, and Judah said sorry, but Judah said sorry because he was regretting. But Peter said sorry because he meant it. So beloved, it's high time that we as Christians, we start focusing on our relationship with God. And we teach our children to have a religion that is focused on the relationship with Jesus, not a form of religion that has become so rampant in our churches today. A religion that confesses God and Jesus his son, but which denies the power of his word. You see the world has never seen. Let me tell you something. The reason as to why God wants us to change, because unless the gospel changes us, the world will never know the power of the gospel. The world is not going to know that the power can change, can resurrect a man. And I didn't have time to tell you, I could have told you that it's because you will actually have to come for the grave if that word of God lives with you. You are changed truly. Let me say it a bit. You know, in the last day, there will be two groups of people. There will be a people who will be resurrected. And there will be a people, a kind of people, a group of people who will resurrect. Those are two different groups. The first group will resurrect. The second group is going to be resurrected. 
when he will be resurrected, you know, like what happened with Zacchaeus, sorry, no Zacchaeus, Lazarus of Bethany, that man was resurrected, did he die again? And I, he died. <laughs> and, and I always pass, I always tell people, this is my own hypothesis, that I think Lazarus died of the same sickness that he, he had before. That's my hypothesis, it's not written in the Bible. <laughs> so there are people who will be coming from their graves, the way they went, they died of cancer, they died of accidents, they'll be coming from the graves, they'll be resurrected, and they'll take part in the second resurrection. There are a group of people who resurrect the first time. They will resurrect because in them there was Christ, the hope of life and the hope of glory. For them, the moment they'll come out of the grave, they'll have the body that Jesus had that Sunday morning when he came out of the grave. That means they will never die again. Now is the time that heaven decides whether you'll be given the gift of immortality before we return to the dust. Ah, huh? did you catch that by the way? It is now. Heaven decides and determines. My brother, doctor, when we lay you down the dust, it has already determined that he, you have the gift of God with you. And you will come up, you will resurrect when Jesus comes. Now, this relationship with Jesus is important. It is the only hope we have now in this life. It's the only hope we have beyond the grave. And this is what we want to talk about here today. Now, let me, let me turn with him the book of John chapter 12, chapter 8 and verses 12. I'm going to, to read very quickly some verses, and I hope you will not sleep. Uh, when I saw food there, there was a lot of food and very good food, but I was scared of getting asleep. I never want to dose. So I, I, I tested it. <laughs> I tested it. I ate more than what you saw me putting on the plate, and I suspect that's the case with most of you. As uh, John chapter 8 and verse 12, the Bible says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus speaking about himself. And in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 4, you can write this one because I'm reading for you. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, talking about Jesus. And by the way, when John the Baptist was preaching, preparing the, the, the place, I mean, I mean um, the way for Jesus, for he was the forerunner of Jesus. In John chapter 1, the verse 8, the Bible says, he, that is John the Baptist, was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. I am talking about Jesus, who was the light of the world. In the last verse I want to, 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 to refer in that section is John chapter 1 and the verse 9. That he was the true light, talking about Jesus, which lights every man that comes into the world. Jesus Christ, the Bible affirms that Jesus Christ himself confirms and the word of God confirms that Jesus Christ was the light of the world. Now allow me to take you through what Jesus was talking about. You know, when Jesus stood in the sanctuary or before the people of that time and said that I am the light of the world, now, let me put it this way. If Jesus was to stand before our church in the Kilimanjaro Springs Church and say these words, you could not understand them better like as those people understood those words. Do you know what sent Jesus to the cross? It's because of the words he said. Because those people understood them better, those words that he said. Now, when Jesus was actually saying these words, he was using a figurative language, a symbolic language, to inform the world of he, who he was. And when he said that he was the light of the world, he was simply making reference to what most of his listeners, the Jews, the Pharisees knew about from the Old Testament. Remember, the same gospel that we are preached to today was preached to them in that time. The Sabbath is the seventh day. Huh? 
argued with them and tried to prove to them how Easter is a paganic origin festival has nothing to do with Christmas and Christmas and all these things. Later on, elders, I came to realize that you cannot win even a single soul by argument. No wonder when Paul wrote to Timothy, told, told Timothy, try to shun foolish arguments. These arguments that cannot save anyone. This same gospel was preached to them. The gospel as we know it today, nothing has changed. So when we used to argue with these people, they could tell, you know, we are in the, we are in the new dispensation and there was an old dispensation. Now, Pastor Joseph, you know what I'm talking about. But there's nothing like all a new dispensation. The gospel has been the same. The same Jesus was taught in the Old Testament. The only difference is that he was taught in the symbols and in the figures. So by the way, when they, they, when they were given the sanctuary, the way it was, that pattern that Moses went to, to the mountain after 40 days, God told him, go down now, build the sanctuary after the similitude, after the pattern that was shown to you because the sanctuary actually was in heaven. The sanctuary was not fast here because the sanctuary was a plan, a plan of God that he had laid down on how he was going to solve sin. So sin originated in heaven. And that is where the work of solving sin is being completed. I talked about those who have followed the Lamb of God from the time he was here to the time he was on the cross, from the tomb to the heavenly sanctuary. That is what Moses saw. And... Uh, so that sanctuary was actually a typical, typical gospel that was actually taught to them. So long before the coming of the son of God, he had been appointed early as the savior of the world and the fulfillment of the desire of all ages. He had been appointed early as the one that the world was waiting for. And that's why I told you in the morning that actually what the world needs is the Lord. They want to realize that one now or later, soon or later. They might think what they need is money, but I told you clear in the morning, this money is going to become peppers. They'll throw them on the road. You will see that money. You will not use it. Pick it because you can't use it to buy fuel. Fuel is not there. I'm talking about fuel only. But there'll be, there, will, there, there will not be anything around. Through the sanctuary, what I thought about what Christ could be to the world. And when Christ came, he used the sanctuary language to inform the world that he was the fulfillment of all the services, of all the ceremonies, of all the symbols, and all the laws they observed in the sanctuary over the years. So, beloved, God had given the sanctuary to these people. He had given to the world to demonstrate how he was planning or how he had planned, planned to deal with the problem of sin. In fact, in the sanctuary, you could see God demonstrating how he was going to accept a sinner cleanse and justify him and finally glorify him and that is why when you get the most holy place by the time the journey is made the most holy place there was shekinah glory where god was going to meet with a sinner and declare that he has forgiven him and him and the sinner have become one because he has cleansed him and the children of israel would go to make the camps the puts they will go to make the camps what you celebrate until today called the camerings of course nowadays you don't come you stay here in town and you say you're camping. But they used to go there as an indication that now, <laughs> now the home of God is with the home of men and it will be their God. Now, in other words, the way God was willing to save a sinner was in the sanctuary. That is why David understood that and he wrote in the book of Psalm 17, 13, thy way our God is in the sanctuary. That's what David was referring to because he understood the only way that God saves a man, the journey, the place where you travel is in the sanctuary. That is where God takes a sinner until he glorifies him. And later on, when Jesus came in John chapter 14, verse six, he said, I am the way. Now I want it to be very clear. When Jesus said, I am the way, I am the light, those things, those people understood them very well. This is the reason as to why Christ could be actually accused of blasphemy. I don't know whether Jesus could come here and talk about this language, Elder Munda, we could actually accuse him of blasphemy. But they understood that this guy is claiming that he's the one who had been worshiping, but that was true. Now, let me take you through a little bit. 
over the sanctuary, when you could come, you could find a sanctuary like this building you see here. But you could find a, a fence like that one that is there. There is a courtyard there, but that gate, that main entrance to the, to the courtyard, to the open space here, before you get the sanctuary, you could meet there an altar of offering. That is where a sinner could come with this animal and transfer his sins by faith to the animal that he had brought. Some of them could bring pigeons, others could bring cows, depending on how wealthy or what you had. And they could lay their hands upon those animals, symbolically to transfer their sins to those animals and to accept by faith that the plan of God that he had that a day will come, God will send Islam to take away the sin of the world. By so doing, a sinner could be forgiven, and then he could take that knife and they could cut the animal and blood could come out. And the priest now, who was supposed to make the rest of the journey to where God is on behalf of a sinner. What do we understand today? You know, that's why I told you, nowadays we don't need to have anyone to make the rest of the journey to Christ on our behalf. Because by faith, Jesus Christ has opened everywhere to where God is. And we can sit in the heavenly places with Christ himself, even now by faith. That's why in our church, we don't pray through other men. I told you I was in a church where we prayed. And finally enough, we prayed through men. And actually, the Bible said their bones and scars are here. Yeah? So I told you. You have, a, you have some precious truth around, around, but you are playing around with it. And that truth was an altar where animals die. As the priest was making his way into the sanctuary, he could find somewhere where there was a lever, somewhere where there was a, a container of water, and he could wash himself before he could proceed inside the sanctuary. And Jesus, when Jesus came, he said, I am the living water. But before that, that lamb, that animal died there, Christ became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So we're in the book of John chapter 1, verse 9. And there were the priest who could wash his, his hands out there, his, his, his legs, uh, remove all the dust of sin he had gathered, and then make the journey inside the sanctuary. Now, the moment he could get inside the sanctuary, he could make his way like this, the sanctuary. On your left side, there was a tape of shoe bread. On the right hand side, there was this menorah. Now that's what I want to talk about. There was a, a, a lamp stand that had seven lamp sticks. That, that, that type of shoe bread, they used to put 12 fresh loaves of bread every day. They put them, when the day ends, they remove and go and bake the following day and bring and remove. And every day they did that. That was the work of the Levites. And that's why God said they should not have any portion in the land. They should walk in sanctuaries so that you, the rest of the tribes, feed them. So they were doing that. There was a lot of work they were doing. You think they were sitting there? There was a lot of work. And by the way, there's another work I'm telling you that they were doing here. A lot of work. So when Christ came, he said, actually, I'm the bread of life, referring to that bread. Those, 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 um, and the loaves of bread that, uh, that sat there. But beloved, I'm concerned about this menorah. This lamp stick that was, was standing here. Now I want you to follow me clearly because this is where God wants to call us to. The sanctuary was designed in such a way that it was covered everywhere that there was no natural light that was supposed to come in. So if you could get in that sanctuary and the menorah was not lighted up, you could not see where to step. That is very important. That was the only source of light in the sanctuary. There was nobody who was allowed to bring in any strange light. Eh? I mean, there, 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 there's no way the priest could say that, you know, today, the, the Levites in the, the sanctuary could have forgotten to light up the menorah. Let me go with my torch, spotlight. And no, no. <laughs> he could wait until that is the only source of light that was actually permissive. Where? In the sanctuary. Now, beloved, I'm getting you home. This is the kind of light that Jesus was referring to when he said, I am the light of the world. Hallelujah. I, am I getting you there now? Yes. There is one more point that I want to talk about that will help us as we are done. 
this light, the Levite labored so earnestly to ensure that it doesn't go off at any time because the priest could come in to minister at any time and whether it was in the daytime or at night, you could not have any light inside except the menorah was lighted up. So they tendered the light so carefully, listen to this because I'm applying it to you, by removal of the old wicks. Huh? I, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. You know, when you light that, you know, when, when it's burning and the oil is under, underneath, it will be burning. You will be having the ashes going at the bottom. So they had to remove, they had to remove the ashes because if the, if, if the flame comes down and touches the accumulating ashes, it will go off. So the ashes had to be removed. Please carry that one along with you. But they also needed to add the oil that they used to get from the olive trees. Now, pastor, I'm told, getting oil from the olive tree was no joke. <laughs> you could labor the whole day and end up getting some drops. This was the work of the Levites. If you think they were there eating, we were going to bring them, they were going to take them there offerings and they would be eating their offerings, but after working, you know, in God's design, the system of God, he has no one who is not working. Our work, our work might be different, but at the end of the day, everyone should work. No one should eat without working. And, and if you are, I, I hope, no, here in Kenya, we don't have less people. Where I, I live is where we have less people. And every time I preach them, I have to remind them that if you don't work, you don't even deserve to keep the Sabbath. Because you keep the Sabbath after, after six days of work. Now you didn't work. Why, why are you keeping the Sabbath? Why? The moment you sleep the whole, the whole of six days, you have already, you have already violated the Sabbath. Don't go to judge. It's, it's, keep on sleeping until you die. So they tendered the candlesticks like that. In particular, this is the light that Jesus was talking about, that it was the light of the world. And the Bible tells us in the book of John 3, 19, that and this is the condemnation, that the light is come into the world. And the men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither cometh the light, lest his deeds should be removed. And in First John chapter 1 and verse 7, we read, but if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship one with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sins. Yes. Now, the Bible establishes that Jesus was the light of the world. But when you read the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and verse 14, the Bible says that we are the light of the world. What is the connection? The connection is where I was when I started talking to you. At the moment you become the brother, you are in a relationship with Jesus, you light up. Huh? Did you hear what I say? You light up. And if you are going to remain that connection, you are going to light all the way, Elder, to the glory land. All the way. All the way. You sing, you have another human that sing, we shall shine like the stars of the morning. Because of that light that will be, we will shine all the way. We will be lighting up because Jesus is lighting through us. And that's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. You are, the, you are the light of the world. Now, there are a few words that I wanted to underline because I wanted to carry them along with me. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Just continue saying, neither do men light a candle. People don't light the candle and they put it under a bushel or a basket. We normally use baskets to harvest fruits. Please get that point, underline it. But on, 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 on the house, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. By the way, in the morning, 
when the Philip and the Andrew brought those Greeks to Jesus, Jesus did not talk to them. He didn't talk to them. Instead, he looked at them like this and he started saying, the hour has come for the Son of God to be glorified. And the one way that we, we are going to glorify the Son of God down here is by lighting through him. And therefore, just saying, don't just light up your, your candle and put it somewhere. Put it up for someone to see some light. You have a brother who is in darkness. Let me tell you, in the morning, I told you, maybe I'm saying it. We have even people right in Jerusalem. Our household, we have our children who can't come here. Because you know what? Maybe our parents, we as parents, we have never lighted anything. Yeah. There are these mothers I found in the church. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I digress sometime. There are these mothers I found in the church. Most of them have now slept in the dust. They were so harsh and arrogant. But every end of the quarter, you could find them wearing the white linen and serving the Pasaka, huh? the Passover, the Holy Communion. They were so harsh. You can find that a neighbor has a cow, you know, where we come from in Kisi lands, you don't have land. Yeah? My mother used to tell me that when they grew up, they were used to be told by their fathers that a time is going to come where, where you will not have land and you will have to tie your cows in your homestead. And they could look at the cow, they laugh, and they say, where are you going to tie it? They couldn't see where you could tie a cow because they had lands, huge chunks of lands. Cows could walk for days and come back. But their forefathers told them, a day is coming. You will never have land. And you're going to take your cows and your cows and, and tie them in your homestead. Did it happen or it happened? In fact, we are not tying the cows only. We are tying even the chicken. <laughs> and when the time came for tying, there were so many places to tie. They didn't see where to tie a cow because cows never used to have ropes. They used to roam everywhere. But when time came elder, they had so many places to tie them from the legs to their horns and everywhere. And they are tying even chicken, by the way. Now, I used to see, I used to see a neighbor who is not a seventh-day Adventist, not, not a Christian. His cow could by accident break the rope and they get into a Christian. This woman who comes to church and serves us to the Holy Communion and it will get there, it will accidentally eat the mace. Mm, the Christian who, this Christian could come. Mm, could go back and take a reso. You know the resos? Tie them here and, and, and she will shout like a mad woman in the marketplace. And she would say so many things, how these neighbors are envious to her because she has taken her children to university. And the neighbor can't figure out what is the relationship between the cow accidentally breaking the rope and getting to your field and your children in the university. They can't understand. Now, as God is good all the time, <laughs> this other day, the Christian is cow is going to break the rope the same way. It will go there and it will eat more than the one ate the previous one. And the neighbor would come quietly to home and will talk. He will tell the Christian, please take care of this house or else we never harvest. Quietly. And who between them is a Christian? Tell me. Who between them is a Christian? Used to have our fathers, these, these old men you see here, but these are Christians. I'm not talking about them. This is Gizzy man, Gizzy man at home, not this one. Not this one you see here, these are Christians. They're very arrogant at home. You see them here, they've been battering their wives at home. And by the way, all the men, let me ask you, let me tell you, if you want to know that you are going to heaven, don't ask angels or God, ask your wives. They know everything. And ask your children. I was talking to some children the other day, they told me, you know what, they know us very well. They know that we are hypocrites. They know that we are genuine. They know very well. The other day I was talking to some children and they were telling me, you know what, us, if our father misses in heaven, we are going to miss because we don't know who will go. They confess and they profess that their father is a true and a genuine Christian at home. Because the hardest place to be a Christian is at home. I'm married, I can tell you. The hardest place to be a Christian is home. The moment you manage to become a Christian at home, you will become a Christian everywhere and anywhere. These people who are troubling us in the church, they are not Christians at home. I tell you the truth. So they told me, our father, if our father misses in heaven, no one will be there. But our mother, 
If she misses in heaven, you would be surprised. Now you can fill the gaps. Just like Julian, you know what I'm talking about. Let me continue. <laughs> Men will see your good works. The way you talk, the way you eat, the way you converse with them, the way you carry yourself in the office, the way you handle them when you are a boss over them, the way you carry yourself, and they will glorify your father. They will see your works. They will never hear your words. They will see your words. They, 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 your works they, they is out here to see. And the Christians, we want to talk. You know, these Christians, I went to some church. I told you, I was telling one of the pastors, pastors, I was saying, pastors, I went to this church. I was from the village where we could actually cook together, eat together, spend the whole day in the church, keeping the Sabbath holy, like you are eating. Please continue, women in the church, continue doing that. That is what the first church did. This is what we'll do in heaven, eat together. The Bible says they did not preach to each other, pray to each other only. They also brought bread. They brought everything together and they ate. This is what that is, that it means to have real Christianity. If someone comes and finds you eating together like that, he will surely know you are Christians. No, I got this church after coming from the village where I was taught primitive Adventism. And then I got this church. When you finish, when in that church, it was fire. When you go up there, you will hear people saying, this is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. The place to be happy is it. And the way to be happy is to make someone happy. And you hold hands and you sing together. The moment you finish worship, they don't love you more than they love their pastor. I became miserable in that church. I became miserable because I came from the church, from the place, pastor, an elder, where I could go, identify friends, sit together and talk, sing together. I, you, I've been singing in the youth choir, in the church choir all along. You don't even know where the youth choir is, where they're practicing. Everyone is on his own. Okay, let's continue. The world will see our works and glorify God in heaven. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5, the Bible says, Ye are the children of the light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. And the Ephesians 5, 8, we read these words. For ye are sometime, we were sometimes in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as the children of the light. The Bible is confirming that we are the light of the world. Let me read one verse and lead, move to some, some, some section. As I finish, Philippians chapter 2, and verse 15. The Bible says that ye may be blameless and harmless and the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of the crooked and the perverse nations and our world has become perverse among whom ye shine as the light of the world. There's a lot of darkness in the world today, moral darkness in the world today, but when you find the Christians in the church who are fornicating, you don't shine. When you find youth in the church, you cannot honor God in their bodies. You can't shine. Because happening today, that's causing a lot of darkness out there. You are the chosen people. Show forth the praises of whom who have called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light. Beloved, it suffices to say that Christ is the light of the world. When we are enjoined with him, we illuminate on his behalf. And the cross counts on us. He might not be able to come down back here physically, but he wants to be seen, touched, and felt, and heard. And you are the one to do that. Hallelujah. Now, let me take you through four points that I, I consider important. There are some things which can make the fire or the light, sorry, go off. I couldn't that verse with it, Matthew. And I want you to follow me keenly as I finish. In Matthew chapter 5 and verses 14 to 15, we were there earlier. The Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, a basket. The Bible is telling us that a basket or a bushel may overwhelm the flame. One of the things which will put our lights off is a basket. Do you know what the basket represents here? A basket is, a, is actually <laughs> is, is, a, is a symbol of a farmer's measure of material success. Those things we get. It certainly makes every effort to lead people away from God. And he has succeeded so much in this. He has drowned people in their business cares. You ask them, they tell you you are a business. 
but they were married to a doctor who is a surgeon, a orthopedic surgeon, very peace people. And then every day I could hear say, you know, we have an emergency. And I used to agree with that because these people are going to help people. On Sabbath, uh, the phone, I mean, a ring comes, he rushed the hospital. And then I told her one day, my wife, do you think you will get to heaven by just attending these people? When are you going to get time to have a relation with your God? I'm, I'm giving the example of my wife to show you that Christians of our days have established reasons as to why they can be busy. And indeed, they can tell you we are busy. What did I tell you? Please don't forget, no one is going to be taken to heaven because he was busy. Yeah? That business is good, but you have to have your own time to connect with Jesus. He has to know you in person. He has to confess you by name before his father. That is how you are saved. So I asked my wife, do you think God is going to tell you to take it to heaven because you're operating so many times and helping their, their bones and that? Can, can you think about it? I told her a time must come when the dead must bury themselves and we go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but I encourage you to help the sick to alleviate the suffering. But there should be a balance. Hallelujah. When we become busy, we don't have time to read the Bibles, the Bible. We don't have time to pray in secret. Now, let me say, because most of the elders are here, if you are an elder of the church and you don't have time that you pray secretly, you know, even if you, even if your room and your house is very busy, if, you do, if your bathroom is not your altar, you, because you have to be where your wife is, it's not, sorry. Because that, you, you, do you have altars in your houses? My altar is where the bathroom is and the toilet. Because that's where, the, when I'm inside, the wife can't come. If you are an elder, if you are a Christian in the church, let me address the elders first. If you are an elder and you don't have time for your secret prayer, you don't have time to fast. I'm not forcing you to fast because I know you. some of you have got answers. <laughs> so, so. But if you don't have time to dedicate yourself to God, you are going off. Sikirisa, listen, you are going off and the moment you go off, you will start putting others off. That's true. You will start putting people off. And we have so many religious leaders. They would be pastors, elders, you know, they are putting, they don't have time to pray. And they are, they are off already, and they are busy in churches putting other people off. And we're almost getting off, and you're also allowed to put off. <laughs> Sometime you're allowed to put off. People will be busy. By the way, it is, it is true that when people start getting wealthy, you know, time for God. There's a trend I used to see at home where I come from. Maybe my experience is different from yours. We go to a point where we lost the elders from the church, all of them. An elder is very humble. He's serving God. Early in the morning, Sabbath school, they're there. They're the last one to leave the church. But you hear they have been promoted. They are not teachers of the primary school. They have been promoted. They have become DO. The moment money increases, you don't see the, the church held in the church. Before you realize, you are told he has added the second wife. I don't, I'm not lying to you. We lost all the elders in the church by who went to marry. They did not go to drink. If they're drinking, I don't know. They, they all went back to marry because there was a lot of money. All of a sudden. Beloved, what I'm telling you, attend your light or else it will go off by doing this, by adding oil. That is prayer of faith. That is oil for you. What I'm about to say is important because I told you to cut it down. Tender your light by removing the old wicks and ashes. Do you know what that means? That is the old experience. And the problems we are facing in the church today is having men and women who don't renew their experience with God and they are only relying on the years they have been in the church. Just because they brought stones and they built the church, they own it. But let me tell you something. Unless we remove our old and rusty experience, you, don't become, you know, you don't become a child of God because you have been here long enough. After all, God doesn't have children and grandchildren. We could actually, if God had grandchildren and children, we could say, you are the son of God, I'm the grandson because I came later. But all of us are the children of God. 
That is why when the Christ looked at the Pharisees, he told them, unless you become like little children, you can't earn the, 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 the life to come. Why? Because he got men and men and women who were caught up in their own experience. They could tell you on how their father is Abraham. They could tell you how they have built the sanctuary. Renew your experiences. Please remove the hashes. Each and every day, become a child who is born again. Be born again every day. If we had Christians in the church who are born again each and every day, the church of God could have been a lighthouse guiding all these wayward ships in the ocean and sea of life. Hallelujah. Let me move a bit quickly. In Mark 4, 12, 12, 21, another thing that can put on off the light is actually the bed. Kitanda, the bed, Egitanda, the bed. The Bible says, and they said unto them, is a candle brought to, to be put under a bushel or under a bed? That's just asking. Can someone light up a candle and put a basket over it or put down at the bed? What is the meaning of the bed? A bed here is a symbol of lessness. By the way, I've started praying for myself because I used to wake up uh, the middle of the night and pray. Like today, I struggled to wake up at three o'clock to pray. Listeners, Christians don't sleep until the morning. Please watch. We're the watchman. Please watch. Let us have Christians in the church who pray more. Please let us make our Christian drill for once and get out of. This Christianity oh, that we are used to, which is a form of it. Lessness. Man, you are tired. Even at home, when you are sitting there, you must be very careful and watch against. The TVs must be off when time has come. Now, beloved, because you don't do this, we have raised a generation which is actually used to TVs and movies. That is why you will never see our children here in church. By the way, if you're not very careful, you're going to be the last generation here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You might be. You might end up becoming the last generation here because you were never serious. Tell the children to put off their TVs. Show them that worshiping God is a serious business. Show them by example and by conduct. Be a living example among them. Let me tell you the most convincing. The most convincing someone we can ever preach is the life changed. Is the life the life that is lighting up? That one you cannot argue with it. But Christians want to say something and leave something else. So while man was asleep, the enemy saw so the evil seeds. The book of Matthew chapter 13 and verse 25. The Bible says that when man was sleeping, that is when the enemy came and sowed the seeds. Which the farmer woke up in the morning. He said, when I planted, yeah, I planted the maize only. Where are these wild grapes coming from? Where are all the all tiny plants coming from? If the enemy came. When you sleep, if you are less asleep, the enemy will be sowing seeds. You'll wake up one morning and find you slept. Your children are smoking donkey. Your children are in the bar. They are revelous. They are not interested in the church. They are not coming and they might even kill you. Don't sleep. If you slept and something happened, go back. Ask God to remember you. We will never overcome without prayer if lessness takes over. That's the bed. Another thing, this last, the bed. Pastor, you will bear witness that if there's a sin that is killing our church, it's the sin of fornication in the church. It has not left elders behind. It has not left the young people behind. All of them are in that band wagon. Let me tell you, time has come to say bye-bye to sin or fornication in the church. Tell our young people, elders, look at the young people, tell them they can't get to heaven. They can't let for Jesus down here if they're going to continue fornicating like anyone fornicating out there. Please tell them. Because they're doing these things in the name of a relationship. And it's not helping the church because that is quenching the spirit of God within. You will have people in the church who have no spirit. Their body is moving around, and that is why they're getting us into problems. Our churches are 
they are not focused, they are in more problems than, listen, watch brethren, the first dimming of your light, the first necklace of prayer, the first symptom of spiritual slumber, watch. I will say, the spirit of prophecy says, let me leave that one. Talk about the third thing. The vessel might smoother or it might cover the light. Look at 16. The Bible says, no man, when he has lighted a candle, covers it with the vessel or put under the bed. Now he, he records like bank, but he tells us about the vessel now. That's what, now this is a token of the extras of life. Now allow me to tell you something because you guys come from town. The extras of life. Go out there, work, and amass wealth. Get, no, get wealth, but stop amassing them. You are Christians. I am not trying to say that you don't think about tomorrow, but I am saying strike a balance. Yeah? There, there are Christians here, the work of God, the pastor is here. It, it, it is requiring us to, to offer for God and to preach the gospel, but there are people here who have shoes in the house. They don't know when they wore the last pair of it. Yeah, and we keep on buying things. We keep on buying things simply because we have money for showiness and for flamboyance until we don't have places to put them. And finally, we end up dying the richest corpses. It is good to have wealth while they are in themselves proper, when in the right place and used with the discipline. They quench the light if gathered in excess. Why should you be gathering wealth that when you will leave this, this world, your children will start fighting? <laughs> but have you ever, have you ever even thought, thought about this? Do you know that some of you will bury you tomorrow? So they will bury you today, and tomorrow your children will be cutting themselves with pangas. You know pangas? They will be cutting themselves. <laughs> because of these things you did not bring here for God. Eh? All these people, God bless you so much. You know why I'm saying that? Because you put that property. Hallelujah. I, I, by the way, I follow you. I know what's happening here. God bless you. And if the pastor says you bring more, bring more. Don't keep amassing them. All well, these fine days, you're not going to go to the grave. When, when wealth is amassed and or hearted, it starts to become a snare. Listen to me. That's what the Bible says. Finally. One thing else, one else, one, 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 one more thing that can put the light off is a sacred place. A sacred place. Luke eleven thirty three. 33. Read with me. No man, when he has lighted a candle, puts it in a sacred place. That's what Luke is reporting. Secret place. Listen to what God says in the book of Deuteronomy 27, 15. 15. Deuteronomy 27, 15. Cost is... He who puts on an idol in a sacred place, Allah knew it. Cast is a man who takes an idol and puts it on an, in, a, in a sacred place. By the way, these Christians who come to Jackie, they have so many idols somewhere. What is your idol and where is it hidden? I am saying this because sin no no age, no experience. It does not know a pastor or a church elder or a common member. I am asking, and I'm asking this question so honestly. Where is your secret place? Take that idol from there, because that is going to put off the light. Any secret idol, any sin cherished in the light of the truth will eventually silence the ministry of the Holy Spirit and will surely extinguish the light. Let our prayer be like the Bible says in the book of Psalms 19.12, Cleanse thou me from every secret sin. May God bless you.